I'm going to talk about my journey to a career in statistics, some of the routes that I've taken, and then I'll also end with a little bit about the current research that I do. Okay? So my talk isn't fully an hour, so I have plenty of time in the end to answer any questions you guys may have. Okay? So I'm going to try to use this stuff over here so you guys can see my slides. So a little bit about me. I'm originally from Albany, Georgia. I don't know if you guys heard of Albany, Georgia. So it's southwest Georgia. Um, my hometown, Ray Charles. Have you heard of Ray Charles? So Ray Charles is from my hometown. So we have like all these like statues. Um, is this the little clicker part there? Yeah, there we go. We have all these little statues of him everywhere. He's donated a lot of money to the university. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the world of statistics and how statistics unlock my potential. So my journey to a career in statistics. So when I was in high school, uh, when I was getting ready to go to college, I thought I wanted to go to um, college to be a nurse. And then I was like, oh, I can't give shots. That's not going to be my thing. So I was like, hmm, I'll do computer science. So I went in undergrad, and my major originally was computer science with a math emphasis. Um, I went through my first semester and realized that programming really wasn't my thing. So I changed my major to mathematics, because I really like math, and I've always liked math, so I said, hey, maybe it's a good idea. So I changed my major to mathematics, so I attended Albany State University. Albany State University is a historically black college in Albany, Georgia. It's a small school, probably around 5,000 students. So while at Albany State University, I also received the FGAM scholarship. So the FGAM scholarship stands for Florida Georgia Alliance for Minority Participation. And basically this scholarship was like a scholarship to help unrepresented minorities major in STEM disciplines. So it was really cool having that scholarship. Um, it opened up the door to a lot of opportunities. On that side, our mascot, we're known as the Golden Rams. So while I was at Albany State, I had a lot of opportunities in particular opportunities to conduct research. So I participated in this research um, internship program. It was called the um, HBCU UP program. Um, and in this program, I got to do my first research project. So this was my sophomore year. So I actually got to do my first research project in statistical process control in healthcare. So I have never done a project in statistics. And so it was my first exposure to research. And it was actually really cool. Um, I actually enjoyed that project. And from that research project, I had the opportunity to present my research um, at the FGAM Expo in Miami. And I also presented my research at this research symposium, which was at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was really great to do that because it gave me the opportunity to uh, work on my oral presentation skills and to get comfortable with speaking in front of people. Um, so that was like my first exposure to statistical research. I really enjoyed it. But as I said, well, I was a math major. So I also interned at NC State for their research um, um, REU experience. And with that internship, it was in applied mathematics. So now I'm getting exposure to doing research in applied mathematics, which is really cool because now I know what doing statistical research is like. Now I know what applied um, mathematic research is like. So it was awesome, awesome exposure. So after doing these internships, now it's my senior year. And my advisor at the time is like, hey, what are you going to do next? So for me at the time, I really didn't know what you could do with a degree in mathematics. My understanding at the time was I'll be a teacher because that's all you can do in a math degree. So I thought. So um, he was like, no, maybe you should major in biostatistics. So do you know what my first reaction was? Bio what? What is biostatistics? So how many of you have heard of biostatistics before? Wonderful. So at the time, I had never heard of biostatistics. So for those of you who haven't heard of biostatistics, you first think about statistics. And you ask yourself, what is statistics? So statistics itself gives meaning to numbers. And that's how we collect the data, how we process the data, and how we analyze the data. So then you break that statistics up and you look at a branch of statistics, which is biostatistics. 
So biostatistics is the application of statistics in the area of public health and biology. So it sounds good. Remember I said I wanted to be a nurse. I wanted to be a nurse because I wanted to help people. So you're telling me I can use my math skills to help people? Sounds like a good choice to me. So my next question to my advisor was, well, what do biostatisticians do? So for those of you who don't know, biostatisticians, basically you're using a sample to draw inference about a population. Some of the things that you're doing as a biostatistician, you are collecting the data, you are organizing the data, and you are analyzing the data. And you're analyzing the data and you're getting results. And these results are based on your specific design of your data. And you're basically drawing conclusions in the area of public health or biomedical phenomena. So my next question to him was, where can I work? So a biostatistician can work in all sectors. When I say all sectors, I mean industry, government, academia. So within academia, it can be within a math department, a biostat department, uh, epi department, or a public health department. You can also work within statistical software. How many of you guys are familiar with SAS? Yeah, pretty much everybody, right? So SAS, you can work for SAS, you can work for S+. You can also work in the government for the CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control. You can work for the NIH. You can also work in the pharmaceutical industry. Are you guys familiar with Johnson & Johnson? You can work for Johnson & Johnson. You can work for Eli Lilly. So with so many opportunities in so many different areas, I was sold. So I ended up attending Florida State University. Any Seminole fans? No, that's fine. So I am a Seminole. Uh, I received my PhD from Florida State in Biostat. My research is the examination, my dissertation research was the examination of the concept of frailty in the elderly. So while doing my, um, uh, my PhD at Florida State, I actually had the opportunity to intern. So as I said, my research was in aging. So I did an internship at the Laboratory for Epidemiology and Population Science. And at, that was at the National Institute on Aging at the National Institute of Health. So I really got a firsthand experience of what it would be like working for the government as a statistician. So it was a really great experience for me. So if you're interested in biostat and becoming a biostatistician, if you're an undergrad, some of the things that I would recommend you do is to have a strong background in mathematics. So that means taking your multivariate calculus, your linear algebra, but also taking as many statistics courses as offered at your university. So any probability and stat course, take them all. And also be, become proficient in some type of software language. Now I don't mean you guys need to be an ex expert in SAS or be an expert in R, but get some type of exposure to it. Um, everybody knows that R is free, so you can download R, but SAS also has what's called SAS University. Have you guys heard of that? So SAS, if you haven't, SAS has SAS University. So as long as you're affiliated with the university, you can actually download it for free. And they also have these free um, tutorials. So like Intro to SAS, Learning SAS Basic. You can take these tutorials and it'll kind of give you some exposure to SAS. And then developing, my last advice, um, is developing good communication skills. So what that means is if you get the opportunity to present your research or any work that you're doing, let's say you're doing a research project in your class, take it off campus, go present it somewhere so you get comfortable with speaking in front of individuals. Or if you go to a conference, do an oral presentation, do a poster presentation, but get comfortable with talking about the research that you're doing. So the typical um, programs for uh, biostatistics, if you do a master program, the coursework tends to be about one or two years of coursework, and then you'll um, have to do some programs require a master thesis. If you decide to do the PhD program, the first two to three years are going to be coursework, and then you'll have a what's called a PhD qualifier exam. That basically means Okay, did you learn what you, those courses that you took those first two semesters, did you really comprehend what you were supposed to learn? So different universities do different requirements. My university, it was like an eight-hour exam. Some universities do a combination of exam, 
written exam and oral. Some universities do a take home. So it depends on the particular institution. Um, and then the last phase is your dissertation phase, in which you're doing your research in. And typically, that can be anywhere from two years. So I would say the typical PhD program can be anywhere from four to six years. And so this advice is for grads and undergrads in the room. Do I have grads in the room, graduate students? Wonderful. This is for you, too. All right, so for graduate students uh, and undergrads, I want you guys to take advantage of any opportunity um, to intern in various organizations because interning helps you understand what you like and what you do not like. So it's good to intern so, so you can see what it would be like to be in this posi position on a day-to-day -day basis. Also identify a mentor. And you'll notice in parentheses I have mentors because I think it's good to have more than one mentor because it's good to have mentors because you want somebody that can provide you with that emotional support and guidance. Mentors have been where you've been, where you have already been, and so they're here to support you. Um, join professional organizations. I am a statistician, so I'm going to push statistical organizations. So if you're not a member of the American Statistical Organization, I definitely think you should join. I believe the membership is only $25. So definitely take advantage of that. Sometimes um, they do offer free student membership, so definitely look into that. Um, if you guys are a member of the Math Alliance, MAA, well, great. Um, also, ENAR. ENAR has uh, a membership, so that's basically a more of a biometrical society, and their um, membership is about $25. And for my uh, graduate students that are getting ready to enter into the job market, you should definitely research and understand all the possible options before entering into uh, a position. All right. So for me, when I graduated from graduate school, I ultimately decided to work for the FDA. Have you guys heard of the FDA? So the FDA stands for Food Drug Administration. The reason why I decided to work for the FDA was because I had interned again at the NIH and I actually liked being a statistician for the government. So I felt like the FDA was a good choice for me. So my formal title at the FDA was Mathematical Statistician. So I'll tell you a little bit about my work at the FDA. So FDA has these different centers. So you have the Center for Veterinary Medicine, the Center for Devices, the Center for um, Tobacco and Products, but my center was the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. So how many of you have heard of a clinical trial before? Pretty much everybody, right? So a clinical trial is basically a research study to explore whether a medical device or a um, treatment is safe and effective for humans. So that was kind of what my role was at the FDA. How many of you have ever gotten sick and had to take any medication? Right? Pretty much everybody, right? So what our job was at the FDA, so before that medication became available on the market, we had to make sure that it was safe and effective. And the way we did that was with clinical trials. So as a statistician, you're involved in the statistical aspect of the drug development process. So from before it became a clinical trial to after the clinical trial stage. So my previous role as a statistician at the FDA, I have to say previous so the FDA doesn't come after me for talking about it. So my previous role as a statistician at the FDA. So I basically reviewed the statistical aspect of the drug development process. So it started out with what we call um, INDs. And IND stands for Investigational New Drug. So basically, these pharmaceutical companies would come out and they would have these protocols or a statistical analysis plan for these various types of drugs. And what we would do as a statistician, we have to review the study design. We would review the study design and we would make recommendations on how we think the study should be conducted. The pharmaceutical companies would then go back, rewrite the study protocol, and then conduct their studies. So once the studies have been conducted, then clinical trials are done, they come in to us what's called a new drug application. Now the new drug application actually contains the data from the actual studies. So we don't actually know the patient's name, it's kind of blinded out with the numbers. But we actually get the actual data. And what we did was we reviewed the study report we reanalyzed the data. So let's say if they said the cure rate um, was 90%, we actually go back in and do our own analysis 
And we base it off the analysis that we told them to do in the IND stage. And we do all the analysis and make sure that the drug is actually doing what they say it's doing. And we also dig a little deeper. I like to think of statisticians as investigators. We do a lot of subgroup analysis. Like how does it affect certain ethnic groups? How does it affect certain people with certain conditions? And ultimately, we make a regulatory decision. So from a statistical point of, uh, point of view, we decide whether or not that we think that this drug is safe and effective. We meet with, but it's a collaborative environment. You meet with clinicians, you meet with chemists, and everybody comes together and gives their decision. And overall, you uh, make a decision on whether or not the drug is safe and effective. So that was really fun. So some of the products that I worked on um, was anti-infective products. Um, so that's like um, bacteria infections of, of all classes. For example, I did complicated intra-abdominal infection, urinary tract infection, abscess, like a skin condition. But I also got to work with what we call special pathogens. pathogens. So what was really cool about my job is I work with conditions that I had never heard of in my life. Um, so I worked with malaria. I heard of malaria, but I never conducted a clinical trial with malaria. So that was really interesting. And I worked with this one. I never get this name right, so I'm not going to say it. But people call it river blindness. And what happens, it, it's, it's a condition that people get in Africa. But what happens is this black fly, the black fly bites your arm. It then lays this egg that goes up to your eye and causes Blindness. The reason why it's called river blindness is because the black fly is always by the river. And then later, 10 years later or so, it gives you heart disease. So um, it was really crazy. So really interesting um, design to develop for that study. I also worked with tuberculosis, Lyme disease, and C. diff. So I really loved the FDA. It was an awesome experience while I was at the FDA. I was also adjuncting at Montgomery College because I do enjoy teaching. So while adjuncting, I realized that I really love teaching. Now, I not only love teaching, but I love the mentoring aspect of it. So I decided to transition to academia. So I left the FDA and I took a position at Winston-Salem State University. And I love my job at Winston-Salem State because I still get to, I get to teach, I get to mentor, but I still get to conduct research. So it's a very happy balance for me. So I want to tell you a little bit about my current research. So um, now I'm back into aging. As I said, when I was in graduate school, I did aging research. I loved aging research, so I got back into it once I transitioned from the FDA. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my research. So my research is the impact of a multi-domain lifestyle intervention on frailty through the lens of deficit accumulation indices excuse me, in adults with type 2 diabetes. So I just want to acknowledge my collaborators for this, um, this paper um, and also the Look Ahead study group. The Look Ahead stands for Action for Health and Diabetes, and I also want to um, acknowledge my funding source. Um, this work comes from a grant from NIDDK. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the motivation for the project, um, a little about the subject background, some of the statistical methods that we use, methodology, results, and I'll end with a short conclusion. All right, so take a look at these pictures. So we have Keith Richards, which was like this guy from the Rolling Stones, and then we have Dalai Lama. So everybody take a really hard look. Who looks older? Keith Richards looks older. All right, so we have this concept of chronological aging versus biological aging. Chronological aging is um, age from, like, from years to birth, um, from birth to years. Now, biological aging means the active rate at which your body is aging. So when we look at these pictures, again, chronologically, who is older? Biologically, who is older? Keith Richards, right? And so the idea is, what's causing him to age so fast? What do you think? <laughs> All great answers. So it's like a lifestyle, his lifestyle, right? So 
we want to look at, so I'm interested in accelerated biological aging. So the problem here is as we grow older, we develop multiple conditions and diseases that are associated with aging. So when you have aging of the population coupled with the academic of obesity, you now have this rapid increase of older obese individuals. Now diabetes and obesity are often described as accelerators of biological aging. So there have been a lot of attempts across um, decades to develop a measurable construct for accelerated biological aging. Now some of those include routine, clinical routine data, epigenetics, functional measures, multimorbidity. But there's also another measure that's been developed to try to um, measure accelerated biological aging, and that's frailty. So first I'll tell you what frailty is. So frailty is defined as a state of increased vulnerability to adverse outcomes, and particularly mortality. And so there's been uh, this talk about how frailty um, puts people at risk of increased poor endurance, um, disability, and even death in the context of diabetes. So this frailty phenotype, which is a really famous one if you're into aging research, um, that was developed by Dr. Linda Freed, that says, okay, an individual is frail if they have three of the five characteristics. And the five characteristics are shrieking, weakness, poor endurance, slowness, and low physical activity. Now, if you have two of the five characteristics, you were considered to be in this pre-frail stage. If you didn't have any, then you were considered to be not frail. So there's been a lot of talk around developing a intervention that could reverse, delay, or prevent the onset of frailty in the context of people who have obesity and type 2 diabetes. There's also another measurable um, construct of um, accelerated biological aging, and that's deficit accumulation indices. Now, deficit accumulation indices have been developed as a marker to see how quickly an individual ages biologically. And these deficit accumulation indices are sometimes referred to as frailty indices. And the idea is that these frailty indices are designed to be a kind of sensitive to and reflective of age-related trajectories across many pathways. Now, what is a deficit? So a deficit can be a disease, it can be a symptom, it can be a disability, it can be some type of uh, laboratory results. And how we calculate a deficit is actually a ratio. So it's a ratio of total deficits scored by the total deficits considered. So I'll give you an example. So this will be an example of how we would calculate a deficit accumulation indice. So the top would be the total deficit scored, the bottom would be the number of deficits considered. So if I gave everyone in this class, let's say we went to our physician office and I gave you a, um, a handout to complete and you had to talk about whether or not you had these conditions or whether or not you had them or not and each answer gave a score. And let's say your score had to be, let's say your score was 10 and the total number of questions I asked you was 40, then your index score would be 0.25. So lower score means that you're doing pretty good, a higher score means that you're you got more things wrong with you. So what we did was, objective for our study was, within a large randomized controlled clinical trial, we examined two deficit accumulation frailty indices across eight years of follow-up. Now one indice was modeled after the systolic blood pressure intervention trial, and for the remainder of my talk, I'll just call that SPRINT, because that's the initials for it, so the SPRINT trial. Another was an augmentation of that to include additional measures that we thought would be more sensitive to the consequences of aging when you have obesity and type 2 diabetes. So what we did was we used this deficit accumulation approach along with the look ahead data and we wanted to look at the effects of being randomized to an intensive lifestyle intervention group on the longitudinal changes of frailty across eight years of follow-up. So just some of the statistical methods that we used in our analysis of these two deficit accumulation indices. 
We use chi-square tests and t-tests to evaluate baseline characteristics between the intervention groups. We also calculated each indice, um, we calculated each indice at each annual visit, but we only did it for when a person had at least 80% of the components um, were evaluable. So to look at the difference between the groups, we computed at each, um, for each intervention, the means for each group, and we computed that using the area under curve traced by the means across eight years of follow-up. And in the next couple of slides, I'll kind of elaborate a little more on that. We use what's called re-randomization tests for statistical inference, and I'll talk a little bit more about what re-randomization tests are. So we, random, we re randomly assign participants to groups a thousand times. So we did it a thousand times, but we're preserving the sample size each time. So what that means is the sample size in the intervention group, the sample size in the control group stayed the same. And what we did was we generated a sampling distribution under the null hypothesis of no difference between the groups. Finally, we recorded the proportion of times we got a statistic as extreme as the observed using a two-sided p-value. So you know I talked a little bit about the area on the curve, so I want to kind of back it up a little bit and explain what we meant by that. So have you guys heard of the trapezoid rule? Great, you guys are all math people. So the trapezoid rule is a numerical approach to, you, um, to approximate the area on the curve. So to approximate the area on the curve, what you do is you divide I have a clicker, but I don't know why I just want to come over here and touch. Uh, this, it's, it's, it's the instructor in me. So what you want to do is you want to divide the area into, uh, into strips, into strips of equal width. And then for each of the strips, you're going to get the area of the trapezoid. So this is an example of a trapezoid. So if you look at the strips, if you turn them kind of like sideways, it looks like a trapezoid, right? So the H is the height, and the Bs are the base. So basically, you calculate the area of each, and then we average that over time. So re-randomization test. Have you guys heard of permutations before? Does order matter, or does it not matter? Does it matter at permutation, or does it not? Math test, are you guys going to pass? So order matters. So a permutation test, um, randomization test is basically a permutation test, and it's based on random assignments. And so with these re-randomization tests, it's basically an alternative to parametric tests when standard assumptions are violated. When we say standard assumptions, we mean assumptions of normality. So the cool thing about re-randomization tests, they do not make um, distributable assumptions regarding data. So that's why we use them. So here's the idea of the re-randomization test. Suppose we have n subjects. And we break these end subjects up into two groups. Let's call one group the treatment group and the other group the control group. So we have two groups. So we have N sub 1 and N sub 2. Suppose we want to test that there's no mean difference between the two. So we want to test to see if the means are equal or if they're not. So let's suppose they're saying there's no mean difference between the treatment and the control. If there's no mean difference, then if we rearrange subjects then it shouldn't have any effect on the mean difference if there's no mean difference from the two groups. So the idea of re-randomization test is you have a fixed outcome. In our case, this fixed outcome is going to be the individual's deficit accumulation index. So we're going to let that be fixed. That's our reserve data. All right. So what we do here, the only thing that's going to be random is Z. Z is going to be the treatment assignment. So you have this probability mass function of the probability of Z given I. So Z is the treatment assignment. And we're going to let I be this conditional information. Now the conditional information is going to be the sample size. So the sample size is fixed. All right. So we basically are going to reassign patients to either be in the treatment or control group. And we're going to do this a fixed number of times and we're going to look at the mean difference. So our test statistic here is the difference in means. So we let z sub i be the indicator that um, a person is, a, um, a particular patient is assigned to treatment. And then the one minus z would be they're assigned to the control. So we're looking at the difference in means, okay? 
So then you have this distribution under the node, because each time that you do a read randomization, you're calculating the mean difference. And then you're going to plot the mean difference until you have this distribution of 1,000. And then you're going to count the proportion of times that you get a statistic as extreme as deserved. Another way to think about it in simpler terms, break it down, suppose I let M not be the mean difference of my reserve. So that means I have my treatment group and my control group. And I take the mean difference between the two. And I got this value. All right, so then what I'm going to do next, I'm going to randomly assign subjects to two groups. So that means some people that were in the treatment group are going to get in control, or maybe they'll stay in the treatment group. But the sample size is going to be fixed. And I'm going to do this X number of times. In our project, we did it 1,000 times. So that means I'm going to have how many mean differences in the end? I'm going to have 1,000, right? So I'm going to have 1,000 in the end. And this is what my, my M distribution is. So my M distribution contains, so I would do it one time, I'm going to plot it. I'm going to do it another time, I'm going to plot it again until I have this distribution of 1,000. Then I'm going to go back to my observed data, and I'm going to see where it lands on that distribution. And I'm going to count the proportion of times that I get a statistic as extreme as my reserve. And that's how I calculate my p-value. So if it was one time, it would be 1 over 1,000. If it was zero time, it would be 0 over 1,000. And that's how I got my p-value. So with the look-ahead data, the look-ahead data was a multi-site, single-mass, randomized controlled clinical trial. So the original study had 5,145 individuals in the study. And all these individuals were overweight and had type 2 diabetes. Um, they did the recruiting from 2001 to 2004. So participants were randomly assigned with equal probability to two groups. One of them was the lifestyle intensive, um, intensive lifestyle intervention. So a lot I'll say ILI. That just means um, intensive lifestyle intervention. Because sometimes you can get tongue tied saying these names. And the other one is the DSC. So the ILI group, basically what they made these individuals do was to basically decrease your caloric intake and increase your physical activity. The DSC group was more like an informational kind of thing. We brought, they brought these people in three times a year and just kind of had a discussion of how you should eat. Here's some suggestions on physical activity. Here's some support, but we're not physically, not physically making them do anything. Just kind of information. All right, so the study was terminated in 2012. And relative to the DSC, the ILI um, produced a sustained weight loss and increased physical function. Now, for our analytical sample, I'm working off the public data. So of the original people in the study, only 4,901 actually provided consent, meaning we could share, they could share their data. And 42 participants actually didn't have any follow-up information. So my analytical sample ended up being 4,859. So for the baseline evaluations in annual visit, they were kind of based off self-reported lifestyle characteristics, health conditions, clinical history, and they were all assessed using these standardized questionnaires, which I'll show you in my next slide. So what we did was, you know we were looking at deficit accumulation indices. So we actually constructed um, two deficit accumulation indices. So we constructed our first one was previously modeled after the SPRINT trial. And this um, index included 29 items that were based off self-reported clinical responses and clinical measurements. Okay? So this is just kind of an example of the scoring scheme. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I want you to kind of understand how we were deriving this score. So basically, an individual would be asked a question, or we would take laboratory results. And um, if, let's say, it was, it was based on severity. So if it was like a two-part question, or if it was like a yes or no response, then it would be zero or one. But for example, look at the first one. So self-reported general health. So you know it goes from excellent to poor. So if they said, oh, yeah, my health is excellent, they got a zero. They said very good, 2.5, and all the way up to poor, they got a one. So we did that for each question. And these are a list of all the 29 components that we use to derive our index. So this is the one modeled after Sprint. 
Now we did an additional index, which was an augmentation of that, and that included additional items that we thought would be more sensitive to aging with diabetes and obesity. So some of the component, additional components that we included in here was self-reported sleep apnea, urinary incompetence, um, worsening hearing, worsening um, eyesight, um, neuropathy, poorly he healing wounds. So the augmented one, and you'll notice that we have like kind of the little suffix down here. Um, it had 38 items. So the one based off Sprint had 29 items. The augmented one had 38 items. So now we have this frailty index, and it is a continuous measure, right? So what we did was we broke it, classified individuals as frail, and we broke these up into categories. So if an individual had a score of less than or equal to 0.10, they were considered to be not frail. If you had a score of greater than 0.10 and less than or equal to 0.21, you were in this pre-frail stage. If you had a score that was greater than 0.21, you were considered to be frail. So I'm going to give you a little bit of my results. So this is a scatter plot of the the two indices, so this is the augmented and this is the sprint one. And as you can see, the index is highly correlated. I believe the R value is about 0.91. What we're noticing here is that the average index score is about 0.2. You can notice that their scores, there's a range of scores. So this is at baseline only. So we're noticing that the scores range from 0 to 0.4. What does that mean? In the beginning of the study, some people were doing really great. And then some people were doing not so great, basically. So this is the cool part, I like to think. So this is the trajectory of the frailty index over um, follow-up by um, intervention assignment. So can you guys see this first line here? So that's going to be your diabetes, support, um, diabetes education support group. This bottom line here is going to be your intensive lifestyle intervention group. So what we're noticing, I'll start with the first one. So we're noticing at baseline, everybody pretty much has the same score. Would you agree? So when we look at the DSE group, from baseline to year, year one, there's a little bit of a dip, and it gradually increases over time. Um, same for the ILI group. There's much of a much larger dip, but it gradually increases over time. Never overlaps. Um, from the re-randomization test that we did, there's a statistically significant difference. So what we're noticing here is that if you're in this lifestyle and intention group, in lifestyle and intention group, that you're actually, it's actually slowing the aging process compared to if you're in this DSC group. This is for the index based off sprint. The next one is the index, the augmented one. And you know the augmented one included those additional items that we thought would be more sensitive to aging with diabetes. So at baseline, pretty much the same, right? Less of a dip in the DSC group, gradually increases over time. Um, less of a dip compared to the sprint one, but gradually increases over time, but less of an increase compared to the DSC. So what we notice is, based on the re-randomization test, that there's a significantly difference um, between intervention groups over time. So you remember I said that we then divided these frailty, um, uh, frailty scores into groups, right? So this is frailty status at baseline by intervention groups. So we have the frailty status, not frail, pre-frail, and frail, and we have the two intervention groups. And when you look at the frail status at baseline, so this is the sprint group, this is the augmented group. What do you notice about these percentages? Are they different or are they the same? They're, they're the same, pretty much the same, right? And we look over here, they're pretty much the same. You look at the p-value, there's no difference. So there's no difference between the group at baseline, which is what we want, right? We want everybody to be the same. So let's see how much it changed from year eight. So by year eight, when we look at frailty status by the two intervention groups, when we look at the frail group here, who has more, DSE or ILI? DSC, so we're noticing that more people are frail in the DSC compared to the ILI by year eight. Same here, so we have 42.66, 39.75. Over here you have 60.88, 50 uh, 54.51, and it's significantly different. 
So we're seeing that more individuals are frail if you're in this DSC group. So ILI is kind of producing less frail individuals. So this is a mouthful, so I'm just going to point out certain things, okay? So this is the estimated mean differences between intervention groups traced by the area on the curve um, for the frailty index overall, and we looked at certain clinical groups. So these p-values are kind of the illustration that I did from the other two slides, these slides. What's important to notice here is these are the mean differences traced by the area under the curve. And the thing to notice here, a greater mean difference denotes a greater um, benefit in the ILI group. So when we look at certain kind of, uh, subgroups that I have highlighted, I kind of want to talk about them. So age group, also body mass index, and CVD. So if you notice, like with age group, there's a higher difference here for the older individuals, meaning that there's a greater benefit in the ILI group. For right here, um, there's a greater benefit for the people who are 25 to have a BI of 25 to 29, which would mean that they are basically obese and these people are overweight. So it's a greater benefit for um, overweight individuals. Also here, um, there's a greater benefit for people who do not have a history of um, CV, uh, CVD. So I'm a visual learner. I don't know if you guys are. So I have a way of showing this visually. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about age group first. So this is the age group. So we have the older individuals and the younger individuals. So the blue represents the DSC 50 to 49. The kind of reddish represents DSC 60 to 76. The green represents ILI 45 to 59. And this is kind of like an orange maroonish color. We're going to say, and that's the ILI from 60 to 76. So it's really hard to see on this plot. So I took this plot and I separated them by older and younger people, okay? So you can kind of better see it. So these are what I'm calling the younger people, the younger people in the study. So the younger people are 45 to 59. And if you notice, if I could go back to this slide, at the beginning, would you say that everybody pretty much kind of has the same score, right? So if we look at the, the, the um, younger people. So at baseline, everybody pretty much has the same score. There's a, this blue represents the DSC, this red represents the ILI. Um, everybody pretty much has the same score, um, but then towards the end, it just starts overlapping, so there's no difference. But if you look at the older people, and this is the 60 to 76 group, baseline, everybody pretty much has the same score. The red, um, the blue represents the DSC, and the red represents the ILI. And you know, the lower the score, that means less things around you. So over time, we're seeing that a greater benefit is in the older people in the ILI group. Similarly, we looked at body mass index. So we have this group up here is going to be the people who are obese. These two lines down here are going to be the people that are just overweight. So we're going to kind of focus on that. So the blue represents the people who are in the DSE group. The green is the people who are um, in the ILI group. And you'll notice that there's a significantly um, difference over time. So we did an uh, interaction p-value from the re-randomization test, and it was significant. And lastly, we looked at CVD. So these are going to be the people that had a history of CVD. Notice. They pretty much have the same score at baseline for um, the two groups. And then over time, it just overlaps. These people are the people who don't have a history of CVD. Same score at baseline. There's always this dip from baseline to year one. Gradually increases over time, but never overlaps. So there's significant difference from the people who do not have CVD. So what can we take away from here? So being in this eight years of a multi-domain lifestyle intervention, actually slows the biological aging process. And this was captured by the deficit accumulation indices. Um, based on our test of interaction, our re-randomization test, what have we found for certain subgroups? If uh, there's a greater benefit from being in this intensive lifestyle intervention trial, if you are older, not obese, and do not have a history of CVD. I would also like to add that this is the first randomized controlled clinical trial to show benefit 
and deficit, deficit accumulation indices. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Um, in the IMDs, uh, oh wait, is that it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what were some of the common things that you like to add into, that you have to like direct the, uh, in the in protocol? Good question. So he asked in the INDs, what are some of the things that we had to correct? Um, it would be kind of like um, like what the population that they are taking in. So it's a certain population that's supposed to be intent to treat. And so they would like, uh, it, you have to specify in the, in the beginning who that you're going to include in the study. You can't go back in the later stage and say, and then after we enrollment, we're going to take these people out. So that would be the, one of the issues with the intent to treat and also with study design. So with the study, you have to have a primary outcome, and that's what you're going to like, test your study on. If your primary outcome um, isn't significant, then it's lost. But sometimes people would try to do, OK, I'm going to test this primary outcome, then I'm going to test this one, but they're not doing se sequential testing. And so a lot of times you would have to go back and say, but you need to do some type of sentential, sentential questing in order to uh, testing in order to do that. Um, other times it would be like a power issue um, with calculating the sample size. We have to go back and be like, uh, you know, because you're supposed to at least have like a 90% power depending on the type of study. Um, other things would be like how many trials are they going to do? So for studies, you have to have two conformatory um, conformatory uh, stage three clinical trials. And some people would try to go back and be like, oh no, I'm going to do this one trial, but no, you have to do two. So certain things like that, um, even with the statistical analysis plan, just certain procedures, that steps that they wanted to do. So we would kind of like go back and comment. So the idea here is they don't have to listen to what we say, but when it does come in for an NDA stage, we're going to go back to our notes and say, we told you to do this. And how we're going to review it is the way that we told you to do it. And so if the way that we told you to do it is still not like significant or not getting great results, then it's basically going to get rejected. Yeah. And I say we, and I'm not we anymore, but they. <laughs> Good question. Any other questions? What, what were your observed and expected in the chi-squared test you used? So in the chi-squared test, I use, uh, help me out, what do you mean by that? Like. The, uh, how, uh, how, how were you able to calculate the expected value scores uh, off the, off, off what data to create that test? So you know when you do SAS, you put in the, the the uh, your reserve minus your expected. You just do like a, the proc freak, and it calculate it calculates it for you. Oh. Is that what you mean? So I, I've heard of this program SAS before. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, so I just did a proc freak test tables, and then took my two variables. So one of my variables is going to be the um, the frailty status, right? So frail, not frail, pre-frail, and then against the treatment, which is going to be ILI or DSC, and then times each other, and then it'll calculate my reserve okay. times my expected. Did that answer yeah. the question? Okay. I just hadn't heard of that SAS program and that, it, and that it, could, it could do it for you. Oh, yeah. So you can download that um, for free. So all you have to do is like um, go Google just SAS University, put in, you have to put in your email, and then it, um, you actually have access to um, SAS. As long as you're on the internet, though, you have to be on the internet to, in order to use it. That's the only bummer about it. And it's a limited amount of cloud space, so you can't have really large data. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, I don't know. Yeah, okay, and then we'll go back to you. So the, uh, this, the, the study you just said, it was, that was a sprint trial? Right? So it was actually, we modeled our index off of the sprint. So my trial was the look ahead study. Oh, look ahead study. Mm -hmm. The look ahead, that was a, uh, a secondary analysis. Yeah, so my work was a secondary analysis. So the original study, I guess I should have pointed that out. The original study was to see whether the DS, the ILI actually presented prevented CBD outcomes. So sorry, I should have mentioned that. So that was the original design of the study, seeing whether you're being in a, a lifestyle intensive lifestyle intervention group actually present, pre 
printed CBD outcome. And it was like a composite um, kind of primary outcome. So it was like CBD deaths, um, hospitalization, MI. So it was like a, a combination of these things. So if you composite means if you had any one of these primary outcomes, then that was considered to be an event. Um, and so mine was secondary analysis, kind of looking at um, whether or not um, how did this affect accelerated aging. But we're actually, I'm doing an actual another paper that is actually looking at the CBD outcomes. And it's basically looking at to see, still looking at this intensive lifestyle intervention group and the DSC, but actually, does your baseline for early status affect, prevent you from um, uh, having these CBD outcomes? And what we're finding is that if you come in a study and you have a lower frailty index, it's actually um, benefiting you from having less CBD outcome. If you come in the study and you have a higher frailty index, meaning more things are wrong with you, it actually is more harmful to you to actually be in this lifestyle and attention study because you're actually going to have more CBD events. So it's basically, if you're healthier, come on in our study. If you're not, you probably shouldn't do this. Yeah. So my question was, uh, then someone obviously your, your endpoints weren't pre-specified then because you weren't part of the original study. So how did you choose uh, your endpoints? And uh, did you pre-specify them as before you analyzed? And, and how many subgroups did you look at? And you know, the, the, the problem with choosing too many subgroups and, uh, and finding significance among subgroups, that's kind of issue. That's a good question. So I answer the first one. So. Uh, just to make sure, like, how did I choose my endpoint? So you mean the cutoff for the, the frailty groups, like the less than point? Yeah, I asked them that the, the, uh, the, the significance was found among the subgroups. We found, we found uh, three subgroups. Right, right. Found. And so with those three subgroups, so this again was using the, so the reason why we chose these subgroups are because these, sub, these particular subgroups have some sort of relation to um, risk factor for aging with diabetes. So was a su suggestion by the clinicians. The cutoff um, was basically the p-value was less than 0 0.05. And we did the same re-randomization test, but the idea here is we're doing it by subgroups. Um, so we actually looked at the interaction p-value. So it's that same test that I talked about the overall, but now I'm just looking at the interaction p-value by, um, by um, subgroups. So it was actually based off um, suggestions. So these age, duration of diabetes, um, body mass index, CBD history, all are some clinical risk factors of this accelerated aging in the group of obesity and di diabetes. So that's why we chose these certain groups. And I think you had another question. OK. Yes. Um, can you go back to like a couple slides? Sure. Not that one. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There are lines in your data. Why is that? Do you see lines? There's like there's like uh, lines where there is no. Does that? Do you see what I'm saying? Right here. Yeah. Well, they go. There's just like. like yeah. It may be just the way the software. Okay. Did it. Uh, I actually didn't realize that there are lines. I just thought it was kind of like graphically. That's how the scatter plot kind of came out. SAS is somewhat okay in graphics. I think R is a little bit better. Um, and it, um, but yeah, I don't have an explanation for that. I really just noticed that. I think it's just like graphically how the graph was produced. Good question. Yes, sir. Um, the, the frailty index seems to be sort of just in general monotonically increasing. So without any treatment, I'm assuming it's people generally just sort of continue up? Yeah, and so if you think about it, can I use this slide as an example? Yeah, but most of the effect seems to be in the first year, and I didn't know if that was a... So why do you think that is, though? What do you think? People, people always ask this good question. It's a good question. Well, yeah, so people in the beginning, people are really, every, even if you're in the DSC group, you know, you get this information, like, yeah, I'm going to stick to it. Like your diet, you're like, you first get your diet, you're like, yeah, I'm going to stick to it. I'm going to really do well. So um, that's a very good question. So in the beginning, 
Everybody has this decline, a, a really big decline, and it was it was because that everybody was adhering. Even the people who were in this DSE group, they were like, "Okay, let me go work out. Let me, you know, let me follow this. Let me read this. Maybe I should do some things." So I'm so glad you pointed that out because I remember I meant to say something about that. So that's why we have that initial decline, and then it is gonna grow up gradually because you know when you get older, the older we get, the more things that we're gonna have wrong with us. But it would have been nice to see the slopes afterwards be different. That doesn't seem to me just from the fact that I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> or at least my friends are. <laughs> your friends, your friends. <laughs> but it would be, it would be the, the initial drop is interesting. Mm -hmm. If the slope coming back up was different too, that would be really cool. I'm different than potentially where it was before the intervention. Like the, the, black, the lower line, is mm -hmm. the slope afterwards, after the first year, is steeper. So in some ways, uh, you're, getting, you're aging faster than the upper line where I mean, you're basically catching back up in some ways. I mean, you're, you're aging, but we feel like you're aging at a, still at a, well, you're catching back up, but it's, I think it's still at like a, a lower rate initially. So, it's just me. Yeah, yeah. they need to, to do an ILI for one year. <laughs> It's too bad they didn't have a group that was just a, a complete control group to mm -hmm. kind of see like what was the natural aging mm -hmm. kind of change in frailty that compared to those two. So yeah. was the treatment itself just a single point in time with no follow-ups? So oh, that's a good question. So they actually, I mean, they had annual visits mm -hmm. up until uh, the first four years where they were like come in. Um, Annually, and you know, hey, what do, what do you do? What's your weight? Let me, you know, maybe eat a little less, do this a little more. So they were like, if you were in the ILI group, you were being seen um, annually up until um, I think uh, the first four years at least. So, good question. Should have mentioned that. Okay. Yes. Another quick question. Uh, why do you feel like that's why you had to use non-germinal? Um, because of the longitudinal structure of the data. So we had historical data. Um, also, the distribution, it violated the assumption of normality. So that's why we had to end up doing these re-randomization tests, because they have distributal free ass assumptions. Um, it's interesting because a lot of people don't use these tests, and they take such a long time to run. Um, <laughs> so I would literally run it, and it would be like, uh, it'll take a few days, and I would go back and be like, checking my laptop, I'm supposed to be relaxing, my husband would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> so it, it actually takes more time, but um, which is why I, I get another question: Why did you do it more than a thousand times? And that was only because it just took so long. So we just thought a thousand would be. Why did you transfer into the frailty data with the with the, uh, the non-normal data? The yeah the um, the accurate, yeah the frailty the 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 data that we derived the index from yes. Well, why not That was just a suggestion that I had. Yeah. We'll thank our speaker here. Thank you. <laughs> and I actually have one more comment. So I am um, co chair of the ENR Diversity Workshop. So, what this workshop is, is a workshop for um, undergraduate students, um, particularly minorities, to find out more about. Um, Statistics and biostatistics, careers and statistics and biostatistics. So we actually have a keynote speaker. We have individuals from industry, government, and academia talking about opportunities within biostat. Um, we have people from internship um, talking about internships within biostat. We have graduate programs set up trying to recruit students within biostat. And um, it's a really cool conference for our graduate students. We actually have a uh, critical writing section where they actually dissect the paper and talk about a paper. For our gra um, undergraduate students, we have a um, computational section where we actually do some programming in our SAS. So it's a really cool conference. So I'm going to leave these flyers here. Um, the registration is currently open now. Um, students get up to a $800 stipend to attend. Um, if you are an undergraduate faculty, you can also receive up to a $800 stipend. Um, my information is at the bottom. I'm serving as co-chair. So if you're interested, please take our flyer. Um, I'll hang around for a couple more minutes if you guys have any questions. Thank you so much for having me here.